I'm excited uh, for you guys this morning because this weekend we've had our, our youth weekend retreat all, all weekend. Matter of fact, our students are still up at Hidden Acres right now uh, getting ready to board the bus to come back for next service. Praise God. I didn't have to deal with the chaos of last night. I got to come back last night so I could play drums this morning. Let's, Jesus, he blesses us all in good ways. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because when I checked my phone when I woke up this morning, there were text messages from about 2.30 in the morning saying, Pastor Zach, why are you still awake? You know, things like that. Uh, so praise God. But we had a very special guest with us uh, who shared with our students and challenged them all weekend long. And he is here to share uh, this morning. His name is Austin Westlake. He's the National Director of Student Discipleship uh, with the Assemblies of God, with our fellowship. Uh, he was a youth pastor for a long time in Kansas City, right? Uh, so he's in mourning after Thursday night's game. Yeah, he's in mourning. Uh, so is Pastor Brian. <laughs> Pastor Brian. Um, uh, he was also district youth director, right, of Southern Missouri. So uh, we are super excited. I'll tell you right now, he's been super challenging and encouraging to our students, uh, drawing them into a deeper relationship with Jesus. So you guys are in for a treat this morning. Can we welcome, uh, give a big Iowa New Hope welcome to Austin Westlake this morning. It's all right, Pastor. I'm going to give him this one. We have another. There we go. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing this morning? You doing good? He's not lying. I'm still mourning the Chiefs' loss. I mean, come on. It's like, it's like we were Super Bowl champs, so we can't beat the Lions. Man, I felt like we lost to a college team. I told Pastor Zach that this weekend. I was like, I was like Pastor Zach, bro, cheering for the Lions. You're like cheering for a college team. When's the last time you guys won anything? But um, I'm, we're still praying for Pastor Zach. He's a great guy. We're still praying for him, believing that he's going he's gonna, to you know, give his heart to the Lord, things like that. But uh, no, but, but honestly... Uh, being with your youth team this weekend has been amazing. You have one of the best youth staffs in the nation. And I know you know that, but they're phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. And just the, the chemistry they have together, the way they love students, the way they, they love your students and the way they pour into them was just incredible for me to see. So I'm so encouraged after getting to be with your students and your youth staff this weekend. It was a phenomenal weekend and it is my honor to be with you this morning. And before I do anything else, I just want to take a moment. I want to honor your pastors, Pastor Jeff and Jeannie Hill. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Thank you for the way that you lead and thank you for believing in the next generation. It's obvious after the weekend that I saw that you believe in the next generation. You believe that they're not just the future of the church, but they're the church of right now, the church of today. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the time and the effort that you give. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in a pastor's home. I know the sacrifices that you make. I'm grateful for you. The kingdom is better because of you. Come on, can we make some noise for our pastors today? Thank you so much for your sacrifice. For real, they're heroes. But as was mentioned just a moment ago, I come from Springfield, Missouri, where I get to serve in the National Office of the Assemblies of God, serving there in the youth ministry, and it has been an absolute joy of mine to get to do that, but I don't do that alone. I've got an amazing family. I wish so bad my family could have been here with me uh, this weekend, but there were some other circumstances that just kept that from happening, but I do have a picture of my family, of course, so I couldn't come all this way and not have a picture of my family, so that is my amazing family, my wife Lauren standing next to me. She is my greatest friend in the world. She is the smarter one of the two of us. Absolutely. She reminds me where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there, and she is just the greatest gift that God has ever given me outside of salvation. And they're right there are my children, uh, my two kids. My son Jude is six years old, and uh, he is miracle baby number one, but he is six years old. He's already developing a sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, he was actually praying for the people who would be sitting in this service before I ever got on the airplane and came up here to Iowa. So whether or not you have faith for yourself today, a six-year-old boy named Jude in Missouri has faith for you, believing that God's going to move and that God's going to speak to your heart today. And then right next to him is my two-year-old daughter named Quinn. And just as my son is developing a sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit, uh, we need to pray for that girl because she needs Jesus, okay, in a very real way. Uh, she needs the Lord to move on her heart because uh, she's wild right now. And uh, we're just 
trying to figure out what in the world's going on. But we love her so much. Uh, never a dull moment with Quinn in the house. And uh, she's miracle baby number two. And then as you can see, they are holding a sonogram picture because uh, we are expecting another baby in October. We are expecting baby number three. So uh, we just will not be sleeping much this fall. And... Uh, <laughs> We know we're not going to be getting much sleep, and we don't know if we're having a boy or a girl. Um, I wanted to find out what we were having. I wanted to know what we were getting into. Um, my wife did not want to find out, and so we both compromised, and we're not going to find out until the baby gets here. And uh, all of the husbands in the room said amen. Uh, I'm young, but I'm not stupid, okay? So uh, we're going we're gonna to wait, and uh, we're going to find out when the baby gets here if we're having a boy or a girl. But uh, we are just so excited to get to be on mission together as a family. It is something that we do together. Together. And uh, this past uh, season of our life has been the craziest that we've ever been through without a close second. Uh, all summer I had the opportunity to, to travel and, and preach at Assemblies of God youth camps and events around the nation. And then uh, we got to host National Youth Conference and a National Fine Arts Festival there of the Assemblies of God in Columbus, Ohio uh, at the end of July, beginning of August. And on July 27th, just before gearing up for our family to go to Columbus and, and host this event, July 27th, on the evening of that day, I was reading a book to my daughter. And as I was reading her this book, she put her head back on, on my chest. I'm sitting there in the chair reading the book, and I, I, I felt a little bit of pain when she put her head on, on my chest. And so I, I felt my chest, and there was a lump in the, in the left side of my chest that night. And we're leaving like two days later to go to this big event. And I was like, huh, that's not supposed to be there. And so I told my wife, and she's like, hey, we need to get you to the doctor. And so, um, again, I, I'm obedient. So the next day, I uh, went to the doctor, and... Um, the, the doctor was somewhat, somewhat concerned, but not fully concerned. But either way, they set me up with, with some different testing and different things. And so after we got back from the conference, went ahead and, and got some imaging done and tests. And over the next few weeks, did a series of tests. And uh, eventually, a test came back that I had uh, actually uh, been diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer in, uh, in August. So diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer in August. On August 29th, I, I had the tumor removed. I actually had a mastectomy on the left side of my chest. This is just this past August, so it's uh, 12, 12 days ago now. I had surgery to, to remove that. And uh, right now we are currently waiting on tests to come back to find out what kind of treatment I'm going to need and if I'm going to need chemotherapy and things like that. And uh, we're believing that God's going to do a miracle yet in my body. Uh, the, the surgery went as well as it could have. Surgery went, went really well or else I wouldn't be standing here today. I told my surgeon, this is where I need to be on this date. Is there any way we can make it happen? He said, we're going to do our best. And so I had a really great surgeon and the hand of the Lord was guiding the process. But uh, we're not out of the valley yet. My family's in, in the middle of the valley currently waiting to see what the future looks like. I don't know what the next few months look like, but I do know this. The same God who has been with me through every moment is going to continue to be with me. And if that God is with me, I believe that our Lord and Savior is with you as well, regardless of what you're walking through today. So understand this. The same God who is with me is going to be with you regardless of what you're walking through. And we can say that in confidence because God does not change. That's who he is. That's who he's always been. And so we're just walking forward in faith right now. No certainty, but complete faith that God is who he says he is and he can do what he said that he can do. And it really is my honor to be here with you this morning. I do not take it for granted because I know how quickly these moments can be taken away. But I don't want to waste any more time. I want to jump right into God's Word. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and get it out. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Comes right after Acts chapter 15. I promise you it's in there. If you can't find it, ask your neighbor. If your neighbor can't find it, you need a new neighbor. You should be sitting next to somebody else. Acts chapter 16. But as I mentioned, uh, we have the opportunity, my family and I, of, of serving in the Assemblies of God. And, and for us, that means a lot of times traveling and, and preaching at different youth events and going to different churches and serving our churches in that way. And uh, sometimes that requires me jumping on a plane. Other times that requires me uh, jumping in my car and making long road trips and long drives. And uh, there was one, one afternoon where I was on a long drive across the state of Kansas. I was going to, to speak at an event there and driving across the state of Kansas and Many of you in this room have probably driven across the state of Kansas. It is a long state to drive across, am I right? I mean, it just seems like it goes on forever. 
So I'm driving across the state of Kansas, and as I'm driving, I, I get to this two-lane highway, and, and I can tell as I get on this two-lane highway that the wind has started to pick up in the region where I'm driving. I could, I could feel it in my car, and then sure enough, I look out my passenger side window, and there's this sign that says, caution, wind current. Basically, this is a wind crossing sign. Now, I've been to other countries. I've seen camel crossing, right? I've seen, I've seen elephant crossing. I've seen a crocodile crossing, alligator crossing in these different places, panther crossing, of course, deer crossing. I've never seen wind crossing before. Uh, what that means is basically that enough people have been blown off of the road that they're letting you know you could be next because you're driving on this road. So I'm full of confidence, but I see this sign, and then I look out my driver's side window, and about a quarter of a mile off of the road, I see something that's very familiar to people in Iowa, and that's a wind farm, right? It's a cluster of these giant freestanding wind turbines, and when the wind blows through a region, the fan blades, they turn, and they create this energy that we know as electricity. And as I'm driving on, on this road, I just had this interesting thought drop into my mind. And the thought was this. Isn't it interesting how the very same element that is a risk to me right over here on the road is actually seen as a resource right out here in the field? Isn't it interesting that the very same element that is seen as a hazard right over here is actually seen as a harvest right out there? Isn't it interesting that the very same element that I as the traveler am now having to watch out for is the exact same element that the farmer or the group who owns that wind farm is actually hoping for, believing for, and praying for? What is the difference? I think it comes down to one word. That word is commitment. Commitment is the difference. Because for me as the traveler, and I'm just passing through that land, but I had places that I was trying to go. I, I had things that I was trying to do, people I needed to be with. I had an event that I had to attend. I was just passing through. But the farmer, the farmer's not just passing through. The farmer is planted in that land. The farmer is committed to that place. The farmer is invested there. The farmer is deeply committed to that land and what it can produce. And commitment changes everything because commitment simply sees things differently. I want to preach a message today, and if I had to give it a title, it would be this. Commitment sees it differently. Commitment sees it differently. If you're taking notes, you can write that down in your notes. Commitment sees it differently. And the reason why I wanted to preach this specific message and felt like this is the one that the Lord put on my heart is because if you look at statistics, whether they are true or not, and whether they have solid research behind them or not, what statistics would show us right now is that there are a record number of people in America who are walking away from their faith. That there are a record number of people who are denying the Lord, even though they followed the Lord their whole life, they're walking away from their faith, denying what they know to be true in the deepest part of who they are. But the truth is, not everyone in this room is going to walk away from their faith. Not all of us are going to give up on God. Not all of us are going to turn our back on Him. And I honestly think that the enemy of our soul if he cannot get us to walk away from our faith, if he cannot get us to turn our back on God, I think he would settle for getting us casually interested in our faith. Because what happens is when people of God become casually interested in their faith, they start to see things as a threat that they should see as an opportunity. See, to the casually interested, when we give of our time to build the church and build God's kingdom, it looks like nothing more than a threat to our calendar. And to the casually interested, when we give our gifts and our skills and our ability to build the house of God, it looks like nothing more than a threat to our own influence or our own gain. And to the casually interested, when we give of our finances to missions or to speed the light or to some kind of initiative that the church is getting behind, it looks like nothing more than a threat to our bank account. But to the person who is deeply committed, he or she knows that to the degree we give, it will be given back to us a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over according to God's word and God's will. Church, I'm telling you, commitment changes everything because commitment simply sees things differently. Commitment sees it differently. We're going to jump into a passage of scripture that I just think explains this beautifully. It's in Acts chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 22. And to give you a little bit of context, even though it's a very familiar passage to many of us in this room, uh, what's happening in this passage is the Apostle Paul and a few of his companions are on a missionary journey. 
And if you know the ministry of the Apostle Paul, he went on a number of missionary journeys, and we're catching up with him on his second missionary journey. He's in the region of Macedonia in a city called Philippi. He's there building the church, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's raising people up, and eventually there is a demon-possessed girl who also happens to be a slave girl who starts berating him and his friends. She's following them around, she's yelling at them, and finally... The Apostle Paul gets so tired of it, he turns around and he casts the demon out of her right there in public. Well, when the demon left her, so too did her ability to make money for her masters because she was a fortune teller and she would make money for her masters based on telling the fortunes of people who would pay the money. And so the moment that the demon was cast out of her, she lost her ability to make the money for her masters. Her masters are upset. They throw the city into an uproar. And that is where we pick up in our passage in verse 22. It says this. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. At about midnight, somebody say about midnight. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken at once, all of the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, he rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all of the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly and without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. And now they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. Paul was not playing any games. <laughs> and the truth is, Paul did not want to go to the region of Macedonia, or at least, at least this area of Macedonia in this season of his ministry. In fact, the Apostle Paul had an agenda. He had a plan, and, and this city of Philippi in Macedonia was not on that agenda for this specific time. He had an agenda. But the Holy Spirit appeared to Paul in a dream and essentially told him that he needed to go to Macedonia. So even though Paul had an agenda, he had to be willing to put down his agenda so he could pick up the assignment that God had for his life. You ever wonder what it would look like if we were willing to put down our agenda so we could pick up God's assignment for our life? I think what would happen is we would end up walking in ordered steps rather than made plans. If you look at scripture, it's very clear that in his heart, a man makes his plans, but it's the Lord who establishes and orders his steps. I don't know about you, but I would much rather have ordered steps than made plans. Made plans make sense before they've happened, but ordered steps make sense after they've happened, and you look back and see the faithfulness of God, that he never walked out and he never left us in any moment. That starts with putting down our agenda so we can pick up the assignment that God has for our life. We've got to be willing to put down our agenda because God's assignment is so much more fulfilling anyways. So he put down his agenda, he picked up the assignment that God had for him and it, it led him into the city of Philippi in a region called Macedonia and he gets there and he's building the church. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's raising up leaders. He's doing what God asked him to do. He casts the demon out and he ends up getting beaten, the Roman flogging, and then put into prison. Now, I don't know if you've ever researched what a Roman flogging looks like, but what they would have done is they would have tied Paul and Silas up by their hands. They would have stripped them, and then they would have begun to whip them and beat them from the bottom of their neck all the way down to their knees on their backside. 
Their body would have literally been filleted right there in front of everyone. They would have had broken bones. They would have had injuries that would never heal. It was a near-death beating that they received. And on top of that, they were taken from that moment, they were put in prison, and they were taken to the inner cell. Now, the inner cell of their prisons would have set at a level slightly lower than the rest of the cells in the prison, so that all of the waste and all of the filth from the other cells could flow into their cell. So they're now standing ankle deep in all kinds of filth and waste. They've been beaten nearly to death. Their legs are spread apart and put in the stock so they have to carry their weight in an uncomfortable position even though they are in pain and they've got open wounds all over them. That is where they found themselves. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like an enjoyable Saturday evening to me. That's not a place that I want to end up in. And the interesting thing is that they were doing exactly what God asked them to do. They were doing exactly what God asked them to do, but it led them to a place that looked and felt and even smelt an awful lot like loss. You ever notice how sometimes we can do exactly what God asks us to do, but it leads us to a place that looks like loss? And I'm not talking about the loss of a loved one, but I mean, have you ever done exactly what you needed to do, but that person still didn't forgive you? Have you ever done exactly what God asked you to do with your finances, but you felt as though you, you still didn't receive the blessing you thought you were going to receive in the moment you thought you were going to receive it? Or have you ever done exactly what you felt God wanted you to do at work, but you still didn't get the promotion? Have you ever done what God asked you to do and found that it led you to a place that looked like loss? And not just to you, but to other people. I would argue that sometimes obedience actually looks a little bit irresponsible, especially to people who didn't hear the word of the Lord on our behalf. I would go as far as to say sometimes obedience can actually look like negligence because of where it leads us for a few moments. Webster's definition of negligence is this. I think we got it on the screen. It's the failure to exercise the care that a reasonably prudent person would exercise in like circumstances. That's negligence. The failure to exercise the care that a reasonably prudent person would exercise in like circumstances. To me, that sounds a little bit like obedience because obedience is not reasonable, but obedience is always blessable. And obedience is not normal, but it is obedience that often produces a miracle in and through our lives. My wife and I were sitting at a, a missions dinner where we were trying to raise money for, for Speed the Light. It's the student missions initiative of the Assemblies of God. I know it is not foreign to you here. We're trying to raise money for Speed the Light, and we're sitting at this dinner. There's a speaker challenging us, and we had my daughter with us, and she was a little fussy, so my wife got up and took her into the lobby. And so I'm, I'm sitting at this dinner, and I'm sensing that God is speaking to me, and I felt like he was asking me to sell my car and give the money to Speed the Light to missions. That's what I thought he was telling me to do. And so I'm having this dialogue with the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, do you really want me to sell my car and give the money to missions? He said, did I stutter? No, he didn't say that. He did not say that. He is, he, he is kind. He is kind. But he did confirm it in my heart that that's what he wanted me to do. So I made a bargain with God. Never a good idea. But I made a bargain with God. I said, okay, I will do this. Lord, I'm all in. However, I would really appreciate it if you would convince my wife that this is what we're supposed to do. That, that, that's what I need you to do, Lord. We have a very comfortable couch at my house. I have no desire to sleep on it. Lord, could you please convince her that this is what we're supposed to do? So I gave the Lord a few days in case he wanted to change his mind before I went and approached my wife. But I went and talked to her and I said, Lauren, I, I think we're supposed to sell my car and give the money to missions. And she said, if that's what you feel God's telling you to do, then you have to do it. You got to do it. So we sold the car. We gave the money to missions. I still needed a car. So I had to do what I wouldn't advise anyone to do. And I had to take out a loan to get another car. And so as I'm doing that, I know there are people who know the financial situation. And I'm thinking to myself, they probably think this just looks ridiculous, that it looks immature. They think it looks a little bit negligent because they know my situation at the moment. But God had to remind me that it does not matter what other people think when we've already heard the word of the Lord. When God tells us to do something, the opinions of man do not matter because we've heard the word of the Lord. So we went ahead and did it. We moved forward. We knew it looked a little bit negligent, but we knew this is what God asked us to do. And God started blessing us over the next few months. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. But I was still waiting on the running over part yet. I hadn't seen that. <laughs> Had not seen that. I show up to preach at a, at a youth retreat, much like the one I was at this weekend. 
I'm getting ready to preach the final service of the weekend. I'm about to walk up on the stage, and this young guy, about 10 years younger than me, he kind of just walks up and gets in my space. And as a preacher, you don't necessarily love when someone comes and gets in your bubble right before you're getting ready to go up and preach, right? I mean, you've prayed, you've focused, you're ready to go, and this guy's in my space. I'm like, this is kind of weird. And he's just pacing back and forth. And finally he says, hey, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have a question. Do you have Cash App? If you're unfamiliar with Cash App, it's an app on your phone where you can transfer money between two people. I said, I do have it, but I, I never use it. He said, what's your Cash App name? I said, look, man, I'm, I'm here to bless your church and your youth pastor and your students. Whatever you feel like you, you need to do, you, you, don't, you don't need to do. I'm here to bless you all this weekend. He said, listen, I have to do this. What's your Cash App name? So I gave it to him, and then he, he dramatically like types something into his phone and then walks away. He's like, there, it's done. And then he walks away, and I'm like, that was weird. <laughs> like, I don't know what that was about. As soon as my feet get ready to hit the stairs to walk up on the stage, I get a notification on the top of my phone. That young man, almost 10 years younger than me, had just transferred into the thousands the exact amount of money that I had sold my car for and given to missions. And he did not know me. He didn't know my story. He didn't know what I was praying for. But what God reminded me of in that moment is that when we do for God what he asks us to do for him, he will do for us that which we could never do for ourselves. It may not happen on our timetable, but it will happen on God's watch because he will not be outgiven. When we do what God asks, he's going to do what he's promised. He's going to be faithful. And there will be times where the obedience that we have to walk in will look a little bit negligent to people who did not hear the voice of the Lord on our behalf. It looked negligent. For the Apostle Paul to be casting out demons in public in front of people that they knew would be angry and would have the ability to put him in jail. It didn't look responsible. I'm like, man, couldn't you have done it in private? (laughs) He did it right there in front of everybody. Landed him in the prison. A filthy situation. They're hurting. They're broken. But at about midnight, Scripture tells us that they do what? This is how I fight my battles. (laughs) I can't sing, so y'all are going to have to help me this morning. Come on. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. They're singing, they're worshiping in the prison at midnight. How in the world could they respond that way after what they had been through? It doesn't make any sense. The reason they could respond that way is because I think Paul and Silas recognized that worship was actually their resource. See, that's the thing about commitment, is that commitment always recognizes resource. So rather than complaining about what it does not have, commitment recognizes the resource that it does have, and it uses it. So at about midnight, it's as if Paul and Silas recognized the greatest weapon that they had at their disposal was the worship that could come out of their mouths. Because it's as if they realized the battle they were fighting was not a physical one, but a spiritual one. It's as if they realized they were not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the principalities that were at work in the heavenly realms. It's as if they realized the only thing they had would be the only thing they would actually need to see God's will done in that situation. Let me ask you this. What are you doing with the resources that you currently have? I'm not asking... What are you planning on doing with the resources that you're believing for? I'm not asking what are you planning on doing with the resources you hope to have someday. What are you doing with the resources you currently have? What am I doing with the resources I have? If we answer that question honestly, I think for a lot of us it's convicting. Because what most of us will discover is that we don't have a resource problem. We just have an application problem. My family and I were on the longest ministry trip we'd ever been on. It was 18 days of youth camps and conferences and the whole family in one hotel room and one camp um, dorm room. And it was, uh, I love my kids, but I needed to invite Jesus back into my life multiple times on that trip, okay? It was 18 days, all right? It was, it was a trip, I'll say that. And uh, we get back from this trip, drive up to our house, and as soon as I see the house, I realize while we were gone, my grass had died, And my lawn was completely dead. It was brown. And so I get the family in the house. I get the bags in the house and everything. And then I walk out to my driveway, stand there at the driveway in the street, just looking at my yard, trying to think, what in the world am I going to do? 
God, I'm already one of the younger guys in the cul-de-sac, and now I'm dead grass guy. This is not a good look. Like, what am I going to do about this? I'm afraid everyone's going to be judging me. And as I'm standing there, my neighbor walks out of his house. He's a great guy. He's a friend, very kind and generous, but walks out, and he doesn't say anything, just stands next to me, looks at the grass, and then he says, man, what happened to your lawn? I said, well, uh, it, it died. Grass is dead. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it died. He said, man, I, I got to be honest with you. I've lived in this house over here for 15 years. And in the 15 years I've lived in this house, I have never seen this lawn look this bad in all of my 15 years. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, no, he did not, right? No, he didn't. I I'm offended at this point, which isn't saying much because I'm a millennial, so I was offended before the conversation even started, right? Like, I woke up offended that day. I'm kind of offended right now, actually. <laughs> but I'm offended. I'm like, no, he did not. This is, really? He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. He said, yeah, you'll figure it out. You'll get it together. Have a good one. And then he walks back into his house. At this point, I'm like, okay, this has gone too far. I've got to figure this out. And it doesn't make any sense because I know the people who owned the house before us, they had put in irrigation system and everything. So this, this just makes no sense. So I immediately walk into the garage and I, I open this control panel that controls the sprinkler system at our house. And when I open the panel, there's this big knob right in the middle and it was turned to this setting called off. <laughs> the entire summer... I thought that my lawn had been getting watered at 4.30 a.m. every single day, but it turns out it wasn't getting any water other than the occasional rainstorm that would blow through or the dew that would settle in the morning. I was so frustrated because we had the sprinkler system. We had the, the sprinkler head strategically placed all throughout the lawn to disperse the water evenly across the grass. We had everything that we needed. We just were not properly using what we already had. We didn't have a resource problem. We just had an application problem. And I find that that's not just true with my lawn. It's usually true with my life because anytime God asks me to do something for him, everything I have is everything I need to do all that God has asked me to do. I will never Ever have a resource problem as a child of the living God. Everything we have is everything that we need to do what God's called us to do. We see it time and time again in scripture. Judges chapter 6, the Lord to Gideon said, go in the strength you have. Second Kings chapter 4, Elisha to the widow said, what do you have in your house? And Jesus in Luke chapter 9 to his disciples, when they're getting ready to feed thousands of people, Jesus says, you give them something to eat because everything they had would be everything they needed to get the job done. Commitment recognizes resource. These men recognize that their greatest weapon was their worship. It was their resource. So they start singing. Scripture tells us that the other prisoners were listening to them. If you study the, the Greek language that this was originally written in, you'll find that it wasn't just a passive overhearing on behalf of, of the other prisoners. It was a leaning in to understand. It was an unusual response from the other prisoners because there was an abnormal sound coming out of the inner cell. What kind of response would you see at work if there was an unusual sound coming off of your life, an abnormal sound coming off of your life, the sound of hope and peace and joy and love and patience? I really think that we'd get an unusual and abnormal response from the people around us saying, who do you know and what do you do? Because whatever you have, I want that. It was an unusual sound and an abnormal response taking place in that prison. And scripture tells us that the ground literally began to shake as they're singing it, the ground beneath their shoes begins to shake. Can you imagine what it must have been like? The foundations of the prison were being shaken. Metal bars are clanging together. Dust is falling from the ceiling. Chains are breaking. Wood beams are snapping. This is all going on. There's a literal earthquake. The ground is being shaken up. Well, one thing that you notice time and time again in Scripture is that oftentimes a great earthquake will usually proceed or precede a great move of God. All throughout scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, where there is a great earthquake, there is also usually a great move of God that has just or is just about to happen. 
What that means is that when things get shaken up, it's a sign that God is about to show up and God is about to do a miracle. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but things have drastically been shaken up in our nation and around the world over the past three or four years. But one thing that I believe is just as things have been shaken up, God is showing up and we're about to see a revival come through the next generation unlike we have ever seen in our lifetime. I really believe that. And I love what Charles Spurgeon once said. He said that an earthquake doesn't have to mean a heartquake. What that means is that when the earth is shaken around us and when things are shaken up around us, our soul doesn't have to be shaken within us because greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. There's an earthquake. The chains are breaking. The doors are opening up. The jailer rushes in because he just assumes that all of the prisoners have escaped. So he's getting ready to take his own life. And Paul and Silas stop him and they say, put away your sword, warden. We're all here. Nobody has left. Nobody's gone. We're all here. Now, what I want to know is, why in the world didn't the other prisoners leave? I mean, a lot of them, they earned their place in that jail. And they knew that they did. When the, when the doors were broken and things were shaken up, why didn't they leave? Well, by the context clues, we, we have to assume that there's a good chance they only stayed because Paul and Silas stayed. By that point, people knew who these guys were, that they were unique. They knew that something was going on, something was special about them. We have to believe the only reason that these criminals stayed put when the jail was being broken open was the fact that these guys who were singing and brought it on stayed put. So why did Paul and Silas stay put? Why didn't they leave? Why, did, why didn't they go anywhere? I think it's because they had clarity about the miracle that God was doing. See, commitment actually gives us clarity about the miracles that God is doing. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, that commitment gives us clarity. As these men, Paul and Silas, they were worshiping, calling out to God, and the doors broke open. If that was me, I'm thinking, hey, I just praised my way out of a prison. Thank you, Lord. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, the doors are broken. I'm gone. They stayed put. I really believe it's because they saw the miracle clearly. And that's the thing about commitment. See, someone who's casually interested, they stick around long enough to see what God does. But someone who's deeply committed, they stick around long enough to see why God did what he did because they know there's more to the story. So I really believe that their commitment gave them clarity about the miracle and they understood that their chains falling off, that was the preliminary miracle. But the jailer's chains falling off, that was the primary miracle. That their freedom was preliminary, but the spiritual freedom of the jailer, that was primary. That is why they came. That's why they, that's why they were there. That's why God had them in that position so they stayed put because their commitment helped them see things differently. Just stand to your feet all over this place this morning. They brought the magistrates and sent word to have Paul and Silas released and they said, you know what? No, you put us in here without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens. The truth is, Paul and Silas never even had to go to prison. And Paul was brilliant, so he knew that. All he would have had to do at any point during the no trial or the beating, at any point when they were dragging him off, all he would have had to say were three Latin words, civis Romanus sum. That's all he would have had to say. And if he said those words, it meant he's a Roman citizen. You gotta take your hands off of me and give me a fair trial. But he kept his mouth shut, knowing that he didn't even have to go to jail. He kept his mouth shut and he went to the jail and ended up leading the jailer to Jesus. That is commitment. See, he saw the situation differently than most people would have because he was so dedicated to seeing people come to know Jesus. He was more interested in reaching the jailer than he was with reaching the exit. So they kept their mouth shut and they stayed put. See, commitment doesn't just know when to speak up. Commitment also knows when to shut up and be quiet and let God do what he wants to do. So he kept his mouth shut and God used his willingness and his commitment to reach people and change their eternity. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all over this place. 
is as we know, as great as that example of commitment is, the, the greatest example of all is Jesus Christ himself. When he came to this earth, he didn't just see a tax collector sitting at a tax collector's booth. He saw a future biblical author because he saw him through the eyes of commitment. He didn't just see a wasted perfume being poured out on his feet. He saw an act of worship that would be talked about thousands of years later. He didn't just see a crook on the cross next to him. He saw someone who would be with him in paradise. And when he looked at Saul of Tarsus, he didn't just see a disciple killer. He saw a future disciple maker, one of the most influential Christ followers the world has ever seen. Because Jesus looked at us through the eyes of commitment. He saw what others would not have seen. He saw it in them. He sees it in us. That's why he stayed on the cross. That's why he loves us. That's why he calls us. That's why he sends us. That's why he raises us up. Because he's so committed. I really believe the challenge today is for us to ask ourselves, in what way do I need to be more committed to what God is doing? In what way do I need to be more committed? Let me pray over you. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would just speak to us and give us clarity this morning. God, make it clear. Make it clear how you want us to be more committed. God, give us ways to get involved, to serve in the kids' ministry, in the youth ministry, uh, to serve on the production team, to to serve on the ushers and greeters team. God, to get involved, to be more committed to what you're doing than what we want to do. Committed to building your kingdom rather than our own platform. We're grateful, God, for what you have done and what you're gonna do. Use us, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen.